Tonight, we're talking, Am I My Brother's Keeper? Uh, in which we're going to explore our obligations to people who were less fortunate than we are. Uh, I want to begin with something that's uh, rather timely, uh, a current event. Due to the uh, April 15th annual party of uh, income tax filings, the number of politicians who have filed their taxes have published their numbers. And I'm very surprised to see, let me read a few to you. President Biden earned $610,602, paid the appropriate taxes, of course, and donated $17,294, or 2.8% of his income. Vice President Harris and her wealthy husband filed a tax return of $1,655,563 and gave $22,100 to charity or 1.3%. Uh, Joe Luciano, who was the city, the city councilman, was running for mayor, but since that's dropped out, published his and he had an income of uh, $291,758 and gave $7,655 or 2.6% to charity. Now, I'm just, I'm not trying to be partisan about this. I'm sure if we gathered more, they would probably be along the same lines. Uh, I, I just find it very disappointing that this is the level of donation that is going from uh, our, our leaders, one thinks about much higher numbers. I certainly do. And I want to ask the panel about it. Uh, let me start with President Whitaker, since you do have requirements within your church. What are your numbers? I mean, I, not you personally. <laughs> I was, I was afraid I was supposed to bring my taxes to Philly, but uh, um, so as you mentioned, so there is a, an expectation that we have uh, in our, our faith uh, that we pay tithes and offerings, and you know as we, we derive from the word tithe, um, the expectation is you know ten percent is the tithe. We don't, as we both believe and teach that this is not a burden, but that it's a blessing. It's a, a gift that our Heavenly Father has, has allowed us to be a part of. Um, so in addition to the tithes, uh, we also, um, on a monthly basis, members of our faith have an opportunity to, to fast um, on a Sunday. Um, and typically it's at least two meals or 24 hours. And they take the money that they would have spent on the meals and they contribute it uh, to our fast offering. And, and that money uh, in its entirety goes to help um, the poor and the needy. Um, and so the church has a very extensive welfare program. Um, just as an example, of part of those funds were used uh, here recently. Uh, locally, we brought a, a tractor trailer load full of food uh, into one of our buildings in Torrance and through volunteers in the church that came out, we passed out, passed out the, that food to all those that um, came to receive. And so uh, again, it is an expectation. Uh, it is a part, we, we think it's, uh, we believe it's a commandment that the Lord has asked us to do. And, um, but we see it as a blessing and a gift. How do you break it down between church donations and public non-church charity? So we we don't that's, we don't um, get involved with our members, um, you know, community donations, other things that they do. Um, our focus is obviously on, on just the ties and offerings that they provide to the church. But what we do, you know, understand is um, as you pointed out, um, typically individuals that are are prone to give, give at a, at a, you know, a lot of different ways, not just um, at the church, but in, in lots of other ways that they're committed to. 
but we don't track um, donations that they provide outside of the church. We don't have any. Uh, Reverend Krauss, you have, since I've known you, had a pulpit here, one in New York State and one in Colorado, which makes you able to really sample differences across the country. Uh, what is your input on this? Yeah. How does it differ from? Yeah, um, since I don't represent a, a congregation, I would instead like to concentrate on the chaplaincy. So I don't know if you want me to go last and while let the others talk about their well, their this particular one, since you have been in three parts of the country, I thought that would be an interesting comparison. Yeah, well, uh, sorry, I, I, I don't have the statistics on, in hand. And um, so I, I'm sorry. I, Got to answer. Okay. Yep. Uh, Father, um, oh here, you want to oh, use this one? Thank you. Yeah, I don't know how. Long. Why not? It's a long. It's a long. Yeah. It's interesting because we look in the scriptures, both the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures, at various examples. For example, um, there's a story of Jesus who encounters a rich young man, and he says, "I have followed all the ten commandments my whole life." And Jesus says, you must do one more thing. You must sell what you have. Give to the poor and then come and follow me. But the rich my young man went away very sad because his possessions were many. And I thought, well, who could possibly give away everything? Would you ask a family to give away their dishes, their furniture, whatever? So there's another one where Jesus encounters a man named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus is a tax collector. Zacchaeus is very short, so he climbs up in the sycamore tree to see Jesus. Jesus sees him in the tree and says, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I want to have a meal at your home today. And Zacchaeus said, I will give half of my possessions to the poor, and anyone I defrauded, I will repay them four times over. So we went from 100% to the rich rich young man, down to 50% to Zacchaeus. Now let's go to the book of Genesis. What does Melchizedek tell Abraham? Give 10%. Wow, we're going in the right direction here, right? Well, for everybody, it's going to be different. It's a story in the uh, Gospels of a widow who goes to the temple, puts in two small coins, worth barely a few cents, and Jesus said that she has given more than all the others because they gave from their surplus. She gave from all that she had. So that's the direction I look at. A young family with children and expenses and everything may not be able to do the 10%. If somebody who's retired, the house is paid off, their investments are paid off, well, maybe they can get even 50 or 60%. For a long time, the Internal Revenue Service says you can give as much as you want to charity, but you can only deduct 60% of your adjusted gross income. Now, for a lot of people, nobody gives away 60%. Well, I do, and again, I'm a priest, I don't have a family, I don't have children or a wife, I don't have to worry about tuition or anything like that. So I've been giving 60%. Well, two years ago, the CARES Act of the Coronavirus Act said we're going to raise it to 100%. So I raised mine from 60 to 70%, and guess what? The IRS kicked it out. So instead of getting a $185 refund, I owe $800. Does anybody here work for the IRS? If you do, please see the afterwards, because we've been fighting this a year. But the point is, it's going to be different for everybody. And I look at that and say, where is your commitment? Have you set your heart on what's really important, or have you set your house heart on material goods? And that's the way that I present it to people. Now, the question about how much goes to the church, how much to go to other charities, that's going to be different for everybody. I had an opportunity when I was in the seminary to spend a semester in Bolivia, living and working in an orphanage with the Marino missionaries. The Marino missionaries get a check from me every Christmas. Other people have different experiences that they have, and so it's going to be different for each family. But what I say is, where is your heart? And that's where your treasure will be. Is, is there a recommended level within the Catholic Church or the Archdiocese of LA or anywhere? The, the one that I've heard is the um, Genesis concept of 10%. But again, how do you say to a young family with small children, you've got to do 10%? That's very difficult. How do you say to somebody that's 70 years old and has a huge portfolio of investments and everything the house is paid off and everything is going to be different? So 10% is the guideline from Genesis, but again, it's different for everybody. Um, hi, I'm Rabbi Marsha. 
And, um, I, you know, I, I grew up in a, a home that modeled uh, great charitable giving on the part of my parents. I, I, I don't recall, even though I do know that, that 10% is in, in, in Torah as, as, as um, Father, well, Paul Jones. Father Paul, okay. um, Sherry, is, is recommended as guideline. Um, I think it really is, as, as you noted, very apt, depending on where you are, what stage you are in life. What I will say is that historically in Jewish communities, which were um, not literally in ghettos, but ghettoized, meaning for, for thousands of years we didn't interact with communities that we lived around, we had to take care of ourselves. People gave and took care of, they, there was nobody poor, nobody never had a meal in a, in a shtetl, in a Jewish community. Everybody took care of their life and extended family. Of course, things started to change when we became city dwellers and, um, you know, had professions outside of that. And, and But what is really true is that um, even Jewish families that had accumulated wealth, particularly business people, um, that were able to, like the founders of America, the early Jewish founders of America, really made it possible for the extremely poor immigrants to be able to live and survive and get work and have food and a place to live for, boy, that whole wave of immigration at the end of the 1800s and 1900s. And basically, um, uh, giving is a huge part of the Jewish consciousness. And the only thing that I would say is what's happened really in the last 50 years is that um, Jewish people have stopped giving to Jewish causes, in part because there aren't as great a need. That's a good thing. So they give to the arts, and they give to medicine, and they give to universities, and they give to, um, and, and many of them to social justice causes. And that's a wonderful way to invest. But um, it's nothing like the Mormon ideal that you, you give to your own house of worship. And what's changed is that as Jewish people have moved away from synagogue affiliation, it's really hurt religious life. Uh, people are still giving, but just not to the ways that would sustain our communities. And last, I will just say that it's uh, the whole generation of people coming up, have not, and Sadaka, which is charity, has not been inculcated in them as it was to our parents' generation, to mine, and that's gonna be a big, big problem for the Jewish community writ large. I always fear that as more and more welfare is taken over by the government, that people would start to say, I pay my taxes, that's my donation. And that link between donor and recipient, uh, which is very important, is, is vanishing. Here, am I alone in this? Well, sorry, can I, can I uh, address the issue, the issue from, from a chaplain's perspective? Um, and um, we were asked to reflect on, well, the King James Version, uh, am I my brother's keeper? I, I want to do a rift on that from Eugene Peterson's in his version um, called The Message, and that is, am I my sibling's babysitter? Um, so, I, most of you don't know me, but if you looked at my wrist, you would see a collection. And these are bangles, and they represent my autobiography, my struggles, my, my, um, my awards, etc., cetera, um, that I have purchased through the years to represent who I am. And I'm actually, and very recently, added and that was um, because I became a chaplain. And I was looking for decades for gold. I, in this bracelet are my father's glasses because they were gold. I had spare earrings. I even have a bracelet that came from an auction from a charity. Um, and I looked for a way to reshape this bracelet into something that would be my expression. And I looked for a design and I decided that it should be hammered, literally a hammer. And so I call this piece amongst my collection, 
my late COVID pandemic period bangle. I was an interim, as Bob has mentioned, um, for the last five years. I was in New York and most recently in Colorado. But Reinhardt, my husband, Reinhardt Krauss, my husband, remained here. So when that position uh, ended in Colorado, I moved here. And I was wondering what my next calling would be. And I decided to become a hospital chaplain. I had trained here, and I had worked a bit, but I hadn't position. So in a lull, a year ago, remember there was a lull of the pandemic, um, I became a hospital chaplain and I began my 11 hour a day position at St. Joseph in Orange as the evening chaplain. What a journey, the hour going there, the hour coming back. I replaced an ex-nun and she had been on the job for 27 years. Imagine that commitment that she had to St. Joseph. On the weeks of my uh, commencement, Delta hit and hit our population hard because one of the first patients to recover from COVID had recovered at St. Joseph. And so everybody from around Southern California came to St. Joseph to be um, treated. Talk about getting hammered through that experience. As the solo evening chaplain at a hospital that has 300 employees, of which 299 are exhausted by May. And then because they had somehow preserved their integrity and somehow preserved their life, through that experience. So every night, I am the solo chaplain for 400 patients and 450 caregivers. I attend all code blues. I don't know if you know what that is, when someone's heart stops, it is terrifying. Not only for the patient, but for all the staff that comes from all over the hospital. I attend many deaths, some that are planned and some that are not planned. I conduct an end of life vigil for the grieving families and friends. I sit with patients as I did on Thursday night because his son in the community did not want to come and we do not believe that anybody should die alone. And so I sat with this 92 year old man and sang in hymns for hours because he was a Presbyterian, which is my denomination. I've been called three times to an unaccompanied mother-to-be into the OR as I accompanied her as she gave birth in an emergency, emergency C-section to see life begin. I have seen an open heart surgery when the skin was not touched because of modern technology that now has x-ray and you can see every internal organ live as they do their magic. It is amazing. When Omicron hit, I called 500 families because no one could visit the hospital. And so I became a bridge between the families and their loved one in the hospital. And every night at eight o'clock, which is, I would be hustling to a special room where I am asked to give a prayer meditation to all 900 people live every night. And so you ask the question, am I my sibling's keeper? Can I do anything but say I am mind body and spirit and have i been hammered yes as my brain will attest and so the question and i know you wanted a, a fact and figure for me it's been a hundred percent my calling at this point in my life is a hundred percent of my being my mind my body 
and my spirit is there with patience. And I try to have a little bit left over from my poor husband, <laughs> who waited so long for me to be with him. And so, whether it's 10, 50, or 100, it's a really hard question. What is enough? What is enough for, to settle our being in front of God? What is enough of an offering to God to, so that God is pleased with each and every one of us? And so I answer not in a mathematical way, but in a feminist way, by telling you a story about how I experience the question, am I my sibling's babysitter? Thank you. Thank you. Well, Laura, I have a question for you in, sure. in that vein. You know, I, uh, one of my closest colleagues was also a, a chat room and she was sharing just in terms of basically, certainly within the first year of COVID, how many times she couldn't even count where she had people dying say, you know, hold a cell phone so that they could say goodbye to our loved ones. I guess what I would say is for those of us who don't have the opportunity to be that close to um, people in the most um, vulnerable time of need for human something, and, and it doesn't matter what religion you are or who you are, what wisdom would you, what, what would you have us do, those of us who don't live in the trenches, to be able to do more of that? Yeah. It's interesting because I came after, uh, I came after there's been vaccinations, right? So that made a huge debt and the number a huge uh, lessening of the deaths. There were five mortars at the hospital for mega trucks. The fifth was our little one that held nine people uh, at that time. And now we only have three, the little one and two extras, just in case. Um, well, can I put on my public health mask? <laughs> Get vaccinated. Get vaccinated so that we don't have to take care of it. Get boosted so we don't have to take care of it. Stay home. Wear masks. So some of it is trusting those who we've given authority. And I know what CDC is not perfect. There's nobody perfect out there. But um, that's my plea. And let me say, of the 500 calls that I made, nobody heard me make what I just said. I never told anybody to get vaccinated. They didn't know whether I was pro or con vaccination, vaccine, because that was not my rule. But I'm taking on that role here. Um, so the other thing is, nurses have told me, we used to get free food. We used to get pizzas delivered all the time. It's been over a year and a half since we've got free pizza. So I think there was um, compassion fatigue, like we do in a lot of things. We, nurses and medical teams used to be heroes, and now they feel the opposite. And so um, take a pizza. <laughs> Go to Torrance Memorial or a little company or in San Pedro. Just drop off a hot pizza and say, give it to whoever needs it most. Just a simple gesture um, talks about the depth of how you feel and, and how we as a community care for one another. And Bob was just shifting um, um, our um, financial to the, a different kind of question, the balance of um, how much um, our, our, uh, has, how much of care has left our religious institutions and gone into community institutions. And so our hospitals have been asked to do something extraordinary this year, or these past years, like that blending of information and role. Um, so, Keep, so in answer to your question, keep well and take a pizza. Thank you.
Well, I certainly respect the fact that as a chaplain, you are in 100%. And that's why I asked you to be on this panel tonight, because there's a whole perspective that we need to hear. I would also like to ask uh, Father Paul and President Whitaker, since you both are congregational leaders, you spend some time as pastors, sometimes as chaplains, sometimes as community leaders, you're involved with families. Talk about how you manage all these various duties, please. Before I entered the seminary in 1995, I spent 18 years as a certified public accountant. And as a CPA, everything is very organized. You know exactly what's going to happen today. You know when the 1099s have to be filed. You know when the W-2s have to go out in the uh, 1040s. Then you get into parish life. And for me, it was a huge change because I had my calendar right in front of me. And I was like, wait a second. There's a woman who just dropped by the office here and really needs some food for her children. You drop what you're doing and you go to that. Somebody else called and said, oh, I just want a rosary blessed, or I want uh, whatever, a simple prayer. Other times people have come to me with really huge issues, and I feel like saying, well, my day is planned out. I know what I'm going to be doing, but that's not what you do in a ministerial role. Um, at our parish, we're responsible for Torrance Memorial Hospital and Kaiser Harper City, and you can get calls at any time in the day or night. We have an emergency phone when the office is closed. And you get calls at the absolute worst time. I'm a big hockey fan of the Stanley Cup playoffs are going on right now. And, you know, you've got to have your priorities, right? But then sometimes you get called, and sometimes it might be something where you're thinking, I'm so glad I was here at least to be present with somebody. And just as you were saying, it may be something as simple as just holding somebody's hand or maybe singing a hymn to them or just be present with the family. And a lot of times the family is just so confused, and they're saying, we just don't know what's going to happen here and our relative has been sick for so long and, and you want to give them some sort of comfort and that's what you look at the idea of whether whatever sort of situation you're in it's a day where you set your calendar and you plan on certain things happening but you can be called in many different directions so um, i remember once a woman came to the office and she looked very disheveled and i'm sad to admit this but i just assumed okay she's here for money but it turned out her son had died and she was just so distraught and so distressed. And we talked and we prayed. And I said, well, have you got funeral arrangements made? And she said, I have no idea what to do with the funeral about a funeral. I said, why don't you have it here at our church? And she said, Father, my son can't be buried in your church. I said, why not? And she said, he died of AIDS. And I said, I don't know who told you that, but we did his funeral and we celebrated his life and we celebrated with his mother. That's what you look at the idea of saying being present with people. So I would like to be able to look at my calendar and say, let me tell you exactly what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. And I do have some things on my calendar for tomorrow, but at the end of the day, tomorrow evening, it will be very different. Well, uh, as most of you know, um, or many of you may know, um, I'm, I'm a volunteer. I'm, I'm not, um, I have a full-time job during the day that I do. And, um, so sometimes it, it, it does feel a little, feel a little overwhelming, um, all the things that we're focused on doing. I've been involved with church leadership for over 20 years now at different levels. But I will, I will say what we believe and what we teach is that spiritual success, it's not, a team, it's not an individual sport, it's a team activity, right? And we, we focus on sharing the load. And you know, as the Father pointed out, we always have a plan. I have a, a daily agenda of what I'm going to do every day, every week. Rarely is that what happens, right? Because we have to shift, right? We we um, we focus on on managing projects, but we lead and inspire people. So we don't try to manage people. So, but we do that um, as a group, as a team. We share the load. So I think you know much and and. Going back to the, the initial question, much as we think about tithes and offering, we can't expect one or two or three people. I know that you know at times, um, um, you know, the government may focus on one group of people to, to pay most of our taxes. We, as a, as a faith, believe that we all get to share in that process. And as we do that, whether it's helping one another, we have, as an example, we have a, a formalized program called ministry. 
where every member of the church is assigned someone else in the congregation, their congregation, wherever that is all over the world, to minister, to make sure that they, they understand what their needs are. And they try to help them with their needs if they can. If they can't, they go to their bishop, their local bishop, and say, here's the situation. And the bishop then tries to utilize the, the resources of the ward. And if the ward can't take care of it, then there's the state, um, an individual uh, like myself that has responsibility for multiple congregations. And if that state can't take care of it, then ultimately to go to Salt Lake. So again, it's a, it's a group effort to create the success. We don't depend on one individual. And, and obviously we believe that this, the Savior obviously and, um, is our ultimate guide and helper through the process. Let me change the subject a bit here. Uh, Adam Smith in Wealth of Nations made the point that money earned by a capitalist can lead to the public good. I grew up in a small town where the library was the Carnegie Library. Came through the goodness of Andrew Carnegie, who was a very rough and tumble steel man. And he was very, to be very successful in his kinds of business. I'm sure he did some things that he would not want people to know about. So my general question is about how the ends justify the means. How important is it in the use of the funds? How clean do they have to be? How, where's the gray area? What, what is the, what are your thoughts about this? Go ahead, Frank. Well, um, a couple of things. First of all, I, I would love to imagine that um, if everybody really had the, um, well, felt compelled to share their blessings with others, um, this world would look very different than it does now. Um, be, because there's plenty of wealth to go around, but it, it's sometimes impossible. I'll start with that. Second, I would say that, you know, there are times where there have been um, very successful people who is, I don't think, I'm not saying this is Andrew Carnegie, but, um, you know, made, you know, did well in business, but, you know, on the backs of, and, and hurt many other people along the way, and, you know, so I've known people who've supported libraries and, and, and just like you said, at very important institutions um, with, with, their, with, with this wealth that really was um, not honestly earned, let's say, and people have had to rename buildings. I mean, I, I know that's not exactly, I don't know if that's what you're saying, but I'm just saying that the question is, if somebody gives to the public good, if somebody says, oh, I'm going to, you know, build this hospital, but, um, I, I mean, I, I turn this back to you. Are, you. are you talking about the fact that sometimes um, people who can be very generous are, um, are corrupt? I mean, where, where are you, where are you no, going with that? No, no I'm, I'm looking at it from the recipient end. How careful do you have to be in the source of your money? How pure does it have to be? What's, how much gray, this is a world of gray, and how much gray can you live with? I see. And when it's the public good, how do you evaluate this? What do you say? Because it is a very complicated world, it's very difficult to see exactly how things play. I have my retirement funds invested in a socially responsible fund, and it's in socially responsible companies. Is it possible one of those companies has a division somewhere in Idaho where the manager is abusing the employees? Well, certainly that's possible, and I have no way of knowing that. But I do know that if I do my own work, it will be invested in uh, companies that are doing well. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. I remember going to Graceland with my mom one day just to see Elvis's house to see what it looked like, and people all lined up to see Elvis. And Elvis gave a lot of money to charity, but he never took any tax deduction for it because he felt that ruined the purity of it. I don't agree with that, but that's Elvis's position. When I was in Bolivia, we went to a huge uh, museum. It was a mansion that was owned by somebody who controlled the silver mines in Bolivia. And you saw all the incredible 
gold inlay and the furniture and everything. But all that money came because of him basically slaves working in their silver mines. That's a question that I take a look at. It's never going to be equal to everybody. The janitor is never going to make the same as the brain surgeon. But should the child of the janitor have the same opportunities as the child of the brain surgeon? That's what I look at. Yes, please, Wall Street Journal had a great story. Pay packages for CEOs rise to a record level. Peter Kern, the chief executive officer of Expedia, $290 million. Now, I don't know what he does. I've never met him. I'm assuming he does a good job. I have a credit score of over 800, so he must be doing a good job, right? But again, we take a look at what is the opportunity and how can we reach out and share. We look at companies that have so many people that are struggling just to put food on the table, and then I see something like this. That's where I have a problem with that. Uh, yeah, since you brought this up. <laughs> um, if we look at the story of Genesis, where this phrase came from, do we all know what it is? Cain and Abel. And what did Cain do to Abel? He killed him. And then God came and said, hmm, where's the other child? And that's when Cain said, am I my sibling's babysitter? So <clears throat> this really changes the way we should look at this, that it was his uh, defense of not knowing where his brother was, where he knew exactly where his brother was and what ground he put it in. Um, so, I, Bob, I think it's a really good question. Um, all of our politicians are at least multimillionaires. How did they get their money? Did they get it by uh, saying, <laughs> Having a, you know, a McDonald's at minimum wage. I don't think so. Um, so, uh, and then how pure of heart do you have to be? Uh, you know, with all the sexual misconduct that is happening and the integrity of our work ethic. Um, so, it, yeah. It is a very complex question that I think some of us at times just wish to shut our eyes and go forward and collect the money and, um, and then try to do good with it. But um, I, I really see that this question also uh, comes from a point of um, white privilege. <coughs> Who are the unfortunate? Sometimes when I have lots of money in my pocket, I feel that I am unfortunate because I'm worried right now about how much of the stock market going down is affecting my, my future. I'm not exactly worried free in having some money in the stock market. Am I unfortunate? I am. I'm unfortunate right now because I, I if you didn't have any money in the stock market, uh, you would be worry-free in that way. Then you're not worried about what your money's doing. So I, 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 I struggle with, with that phrase, the unfortunate, because it really is not one where we're treating all human beings as equal with different opportunities and different responsibilities. Um, and so you've hit a sore spot, obviously, with me, um, and something that I really struggle with. And we in this room, if I'm not mistaken, looking around, that we are all white. We all have certain privileges that we kind of like to shut our eyes and just keep going and don't try to share. Um, we as a Presbyterian church, I just saw there's a new job opening. And it's for um, to, to address some of the um, some of our systemic issues and people that we have hurt in our history. Are we as religious institutions really willing to be honest about how we um, how we've grown it and quote um, gotten uh, to be privileged? It's um. It's a very timely question. It's a very deep question. And if we're willing to be honest, it goes to the core.
core of who we are as human beings. I just want to um, actually, so interesting, um, Laura, that you brought up the origins of the phrase, you know, am, am I my brother's keeper or am I my sister's babysitter, how you word it. Um, it, it really, it didn't rest on, um, you know, monetary support to make sure that those with less had enough or had more. It's really also about, I think there's the question in, in how, how responsible are we for the mental, um, physical, the safety of the people in our workplace. You know, I, I, um, I, I myself, you know, I, I worked in, a, in an environment, I didn't realize at the time, that um, was not hospitable to me. And people knew that and not, did, not, did not reach out. I think that would be another manifestation just in terms of all of our lives. Like, when are you in a situation where you know that someone is struggling. And it, you know, it, it, it's not the pizza, but it's really to go up to them and to be able to say, I can see this is hard for you. Can I help in any way? That's, there's a, that's another expression <clears throat> of care. And noticing, just even saying that you notice the other thing. The other challenge that I had is that my, my, um, my former congregation, my synagogue, was right next to Santa Anna, and we had no relationship with Santa Anna, and that always really troubled me, because I felt like, there are neighbors. We, there are things we can do that would really build bridges and make some people very happy. So I think there's so many ways, Bob, to manifest um, caring for somebody, supporting somebody. So I, I'm glad that we're touching upon all of that this evening. And I, I absolutely agree. It's a very complicated issue and, and question. Uh, I guess the back to your original question around, um, you know, the, the the source of the funds. I think uh, we don't we don't necessarily we don't keep a record in the church um, of, of what the the profession of each member of the congregation is, but we do have expectations around. Are they living a good life? And so we have some of those um, expectations. We focus on, on it from that perspective. And I'm certain that there are probably people that have done things wrong that have paid tithes and offerings that have been used in the church. But we don't, you know, again, we don't necessarily try to track what people are doing necessarily. But if, if something becomes obvious, um, then someone could be, depending on, you know, again, if there was some kind of crime that was that took place, they could be excommunicated from the church, and and in that status, they would be asked not to pay tithing. They would not be allowed to pay tithing in that situation. Again, that's kind of your extreme. I, I guess I would say, I know we've talked a lot about probably what, what I hope, what I believe is a smaller percentage of those that are contributing in a meaningful way. Um, I think there, there's also a huge number of folks that are good people that worked hard to get where they where they are, and they're and they're giving back to their community, to their uh, to the faith that that they have, to the beliefs that they have, and so I, I do think it's a complicated question. But the, the hospitals that we've talked about, the libraries, those things couldn't happen if there weren't generous people that had had good fortune and were sharing that good fortune with other people. I think there are a lot of good good folks out there. I know we have a lot in our congregation, and we're very grateful for those individuals. Well, let's continue with the concept that it's a great world. It's not only a great world to give in, it's a great world when you try to define the term social justice. I invite anybody to give me a definition of social justice because it, it, it's very dependent upon the particular circumstances, the individual, and so much more. Yet the term is used as if there is a, a standard and you're a clergy, let me ask you, is there a standard? Well, I'll, I'll step in. I, I would say that, um, first of all, uh, as we know, um, the, just the word justice in and of itself um, might look different to different people. But I, I, I do believe that when we say, in Judaism, when we say um, 
you know, acts of social justice. There's an environmental justice movement within Judaism. There is an immigrant justice movement within Judaism. Now, now within it, it's a piece of the umbrella. And by the way, most of the stuff that we do is interplay. It's with people of faith of like with, with a like-minded value system who are who's investing volunteer time um, and um, to, to be able to raise awareness and teach people and try to create a healthier world for everybody. That's what we, in Judaism, when we say so, so, social justice, that's what you mean. Some mindsets interchangeable with social action. What does it mean? It means that instead of, you know, spending time on what can I do for myself today, how can I, and everybody's experienced that, make sure that we do a food drive, make sure that we are, you know, I, I could go on and on. So I, I would say that we say acts of social justice or social action that um, really, that, that are manifest as a way that we express care for our fellow human beings. Thank you. And we look at the idea of taking care of our fellow human beings. That's what we're all about here. There was a Dutch priest, Father Henri Nama, who said, I am not responsible for the problems of this world, but the problems of this world demand my response. And that's what I look at in the sense of social justice. For stewardship, the idea of everything we have is a gift from God. We can't take it with us. You don't see a hearse with a U-Haul trailer behind it. And the idea of stewardship was share your time, your talent, your treasure. But then also looking at the idea of social justice, the idea of systemic change. In 1891, when the Industrial Revolution was going strong, Pope Leo XIII issued a document that is considered in the Catholic Church, the first of the Catholic Church's documents on social justice, and it was called The Condition of Labor. And it addressed the long hours, the horrible working conditions, the low pay. And people were furious that the Pope was getting involved in this. Pope, your responsibility is for prayer, sacraments, and religion, and all. You don't need to be getting involved in all this. But the church came out and said yes. And even since 1891, the Catholic bishops have issued documents about economic justice for all. Uh, Pope Francis issued his document, without a see, on care of our common home and the environment. It's the idea of, I'm not responsible for what's going on in the world today. I will admit I'm not responsible for what's happening in Ethiopia and some of the other areas. But like Father Henry Nellon said, I'm not responsible for these problems, but these problems demand my response. And that's why all of us are here this evening, because we want to learn from each other and take a look and say, how can we respond with the idea of being my sibling's uh, babysitter? <laughs> uh, I think it's interesting and uh, to look at, again, the biblical story. And do we remember... Um, Cain, what did Cain's, what was Cain's offering? Do you remember? From the land. From the land, it was grain, it was, it was good, it was a good offering. And Abel, what did he, he provide? The first, the first little lamb. And, um, and God became angry and accepted one, rejected the other. Why? We do have an answer. Isn't it interesting? So part of me right now is like defending Cain. I, I got the best of my garden. I got the best of my fields. And why didn't you accept it? So social justice, in my opinion, has a lot to do with context. Um, here in PV, uh, a member of, of St. Luke's was the first person to cross the red line. Did you know you, this was a community where certain people of certain ethnicities couldn't live? Yeah, it's true. So, um, and he was Korean, um, and he and his family um, pushed and it took it three years to be able to finally buy a home here amongst um, all the white GIs who got the GI Bill. Um, the first ones that were, you know, from, you know, you went to Vanderbilt, that was, um, who, if you were able to live here. Um, so, so some, um, again, in context, uh, even here in PV, we have, um, you know, I don't live in 
the center door. Um, there's some real historic in, uh, it, issues of, of contextual injustice here. Um, and we only have to go five miles to, um, to go to school, places where the schools aren't quite as the caliber of the excellent education that you have here. So I know that this here, I would take monthly people. I look for the worst performance on the test, the schools, and that's where we went. Um, and, uh, I had an, I volunteered to be at the wonderful experiences teaching, teaching second graders how to read. There's nothing better than teaching somebody how to read because we talked about the potential um, of what education does. And, um, I actually was able to go in, in um, Georgetown, Guyana, is a, is a Carnegie, a Carnegie Library. It is beautiful. Uh, a man worked on his guilt in beautiful ways. I, don't, I certainly don't know that I have a great uh, definition. What I, what I would say is I, I think from a political perspective, oftentimes you know, what we hear is, is the focus on, on big issues that are important to, to focus on, but hard to deal with, you know, because they're elephants. And so I think as, as we think of, from a faith perspective, um, I think the focus has to be, how are we loving our brother? How are we focused within our congregations of trying to help those around us? Who's our neighbors? What are we doing to, to try to help our neighbor, whether they're you know, of our faith or whether they look like us or whether they look like, you know, they don't look like us. And so I think the focus, I absolutely think it, it, it comes down to, you know, it's relative to your life experiences. When, you, when we're looking at the elephant, you know, the big, broad issue that everyone, you know, when they look at it, they say, yeah, that's definitely a problem. When you start, you know, taking bites out of that, what you see is that because we all have different life experiences, we all have very different perspectives and, and what that means. And I think as we as a faith, our focus is how are we helping those around us? How are we being more thoughtful, more compassionate? How are we trying to give within our communities? And I think as we take those, those small, correct choices and we focus on those baby steps, then ultimately we're gonna be able to, over time, try to tackle that, uh, that elephant. But I, I, again, as you look at some of these bigger issues, they're very complex and very hard to deal with in, in those larger issues. Let me, let me ask a simple, more simple one. Uh, a good friend of mine for many years, once or twice a month, would go to the grocery store and buy what it took to feed 150 homeless people in a certain mission. He would do the cooking, prepare the food, put the food out, clean up afterwards, do everything. And I asked him, do people ever volunteer to help you? The people who created the free meal, do they ever stand up and help set up, help clean up, do things like that? He said, no, they shouldn't. Why not? It's the old story about leaving in labor and doing something that contributed, it works from both directions. And we had this discussion over and over and never changed. <laughs> he thought one thing and I thought something else. Anybody want to jump in on that one? At St. Martin Mary, we have a Christian service food program. We serve about 250 families each week, not with a hot meal, but with groceries. We get them from the uh, Western League Food Bank, we get them from Long Beach, and we get grocery stores that have things that are fairly close to going out of date, but not going out of date. And we, every time we give something to somebody, say, look at the date on this, this is kind of get close here. And what's interesting is a number of people who come to that are, I hate to say almost a shame, because they never saw themselves ever being in a situation like that. And they have a sense of, I want to get in here and out of here as quick as I can. Other people will see us pull up with a truck or a car full of things, and they're the first ones who will come over and stop to help unload. And they say, can we, what can we do? What can we help here? And so a lot of times it's the position of the person that they're in and the opportunity to help. 
You know, if somebody comes, uh, um, you know, with real health problems and a shopping cart or a basket or something that they're pushing, they're probably not going to be ready to sign up and help. But so we've had people that are really living on the edge of homelessness, and they'll go to the doctor, and the doctor is somehow paid for by insurance or whatever, but then they have a $180 prescription that they have to fill. So the question is, what do I do this week? Buy groceries for our family or fill my prescription? And they're the ones that come in, and a lot of times they're saying, I just want to get in here and out of here as quick as I can. But then they see something that needs help, and they're the first ones to step up. After World War II, uh, the major Christian denominations got together, and they formed what is still called the One Great Hour Sharing. It's usually collected, it's a financial contribution around um, Easter. Um, which is one of our four um, celebrations. Um, and, and each of the denominations then um, can decide what to do with it. And uh, we as Presbyterians uh, in the 70s were confronted by um, two groups, African Americans and um, um, Hispanics, that um, some of that money belonged and should be used um, in, in ministries for them. And out of that grew the concept of self-development of people. And what that is, and I know about it because I collected as a pastor for many years, but I was also on the national committee um, in which about once a month I flew around the United States giving money away. Um, and who I gave it to, or who the, the group, the committee decided, went to evaluate these different ones, were people who collect, who, who were self-determined. They, uh, they had to have at least 10 people, and they all had to make decisions together. And, it, and if a grant came in and we called it a do-for, then it was rejected. I.e., you and I have a great idea of what somebody in Lolita should do. And there we go down and tell them what to do. No, it's people like in San Pedro or uh, in other communities who come up with an idea, uh, uh, mostly a systemic issue in their community that needs to be addressed. And they themselves come up with a plan. And then they um, apply for grants. And we would give them, uh, if they did other criteria, um, and so there's, there are ways that you can structure um, being benevolent with helping people um, make their own decisions and have their own pride um, and not um, always have to listen to somebody else's advice, but collectively know that they themselves can address and address well issues within their own communities. And so that's one way that we, um, we as uh, Christians um, have to been doing since um, after the, you know, the, the war, um, the Second World War. So that's just one example of the institutional way to try to address um, the inequality. I think the inequality not only of finance, but the inequality of um, spirit. So do, and we all want to be proud of, we all, we all want to be whole proud. So how do we help each other be whole proud? So I, I, I do like the question, um, and I think it really depends on, you know, which arena of compassion and subjective we're talking about. You know, in, in the Talmud it says, um, in rabbinic literature, even the poorest person, the receiver of charity, must give charity, meaning, so if, if you were tied, you must tithe from that, you know, if, if you were the bene beneficiary of someone else's generosity, you have to give away also a portion of that to somebody else who has less than you. And I think the same is true, you know, that there are, when, when, you, when we talk about, let's say, serving food, first of all, there are health laws and whatever, like, I don't know that if you're making, you know, Sunday supper for, um, uh, unsheltered residents in your area, if they would be able to actually come help you and have that 
that, that program side. I mean, sometimes there are practical implications, but I do believe in what I have seen is that we that in, in those settings where there's been a community um, effort to elevate people, that everybody does participate. You know, loads grocery bags, does all those things. The things that people can do to feel like they're contributing to the experience of goodness is actually makes the goodness all the all the much sweeter. To me, yes, I'm just not sure that my thinking the majority of one is why I ask the question. Well, and I would say from from our perspective, very similar to what Norton was talking about, um, you know, with organizations, we have a very structured uh, welfare process, um, and, and I think it's key. And I think everyone alluded to it. it it's dependent on the situation, but in every situation, we're looking to give people a hand up, not a handout. We want people to feel good about themselves and what they're doing. And, and oftentimes when you just when you just give, right, and there's there's nothing in exchange, then, then people don't always feel good about what's happening there. And as an example, we have um, a widow, in, an older widow in, in one of our congregations um, that is receiving welfare from the church, and she's uh, received that. And the, and the welfare program in our church is, is focused on being temporary, helping people get out of that situation. And again, we do budgeting with them, we help them with, you know, um, finding a job with self reliance. And again, that's a very formal process. But in her situation, because of her health issues, there's not a lot of things that she can do. And so, one of the things that, and she came up with the idea herself, and she can still. Um, right okay, she writes notes to other sisters in the congregation on a monthly basis. And that's one of the ways that she gives back. But I think the key is that, again, we want to feel like we're helping, you know, giving people a hand up and that they're feeling good that, that, that they're doing something to help, whatever that is. And it could be the smallest of things, but it's going to help them from a self-worth perspective feel much better about what's happening. I agree completely, but the point my fear is, as I said earlier, a source of charity and help is the government. You lose that personal connection. And it's a very important part of the charity. Which, which brings me up to another question. What should a person expect in return for doing good? I know I've always heard that in Judaism, it's a commandment to give to charity. If you do it, you're doing the right thing. If you don't, you're doing the wrong thing. And you don't get rewarded for doing the right thing. You get punished for doing the bad thing. Uh, First of all, there, there is no punishment in, in, in the theology of Judaism. I, I, for I, not, I, no, but what, I, what I'm saying is I think, I think people would say, they have, and I think everybody knows this. The way that the real gift in the giving is, is the blessing that it gives the giver. And it just, and, and you know, the, the idea is that there will always, you know, it, it's an abundance mentality, and you can have an abundance mentality no matter what you have. And, and that is, I think, a deep principle, actually, in Jewish theology that isn't talked about, but is very, very important. So I would just say that. It's interesting to see why some people give and why others don't. You're probably asking at St. Margaret Mary Church, what do we give people who have been donated and donated throughout the year? We give them a letter that says, take the tax deduction. <laughs> That's the basic thing that we do. Everything else should come from within that person. When I was a CTA, I was with a firm called Price Waterhouse. It's now Price Waterhouse Coopers. One of our clients was Caltech in Pasadena, and they had a huge endowment fund, and a lot of donors would give donations so that they could have their name on the side of the building or some other recognition. And in the agreement, it said exactly how large the letters had to be and how they had to be spaced and everything. Because I'm giving you this money and this is the recognition that I want. That to me is, just give them a tax deduction letter and let them take it to their CPA. It does cheapen the donation. To me, but that is what people want to see. They want to see their name up. That's right. 
So I want to make a confession. Uh, last night, um, one of the priorities of who we should visit in the hospital, because I'm not visiting four other people every night, um, is uh, we um, attempt to visit the people who are currently without housing, permanent housing. And so um, I did that last night. I went um, to see four people who hadn't been visited by any other chaplain. And I must say, um, I was not always in the best spirit because I am taking my time to come to visit you, and how dare you be asleep? Seriously, people. At nine o'clock, you have a warm bed, you have a full tummy, you don't have to protect all your earthly possessions that are in a little bag at the foot of your bed. How dare you fall asleep? So some, I'm kind of ch uh, challenging myself because I'm being honest that, yes, I want you to recognize that I came to visit you. And so sometimes we do give of our time which for some of us is more precious than our money, um, to, to others. And we want recognition, that is human. But I need, and I chart every time I do this, I chart and say, after I've had a minute to recover my own, my own shame, my, my phrase is usually, I found the person in a very restful slumber and I chose not to awaken them. But I want to give the gift of sleep because we all know that sleep is one of the most healing things that can happen. And so that self-awareness of how we give and what we give and what we expect is a really powerful question. I was in, um, in Italy when I visited two neighboring churches. One was the most glorious building, and it had um, it had just one decorator, Giotto um, in Padua, and across the street was the local um, um, Catholic church, and every square inch, I swear, had a name attached that they had donated this statue, or they had donated this square inch of carpet, and that was, it was like, oh, what a difference when a family is able to give the whole, the whole chapel to Giotto, one artist, and, and versus everybody wanting their name on the square inch. But, um, you know, yeah. So being self-aware of how, how and why we give can be illuminating and, and very um, painful if we truly look at the deep reasons of why we do what we do. So just in the way of context, um, uh, I, I came from, from fairly humble beginnings. Um, I, I had worked my way through um, college. Uh, when my wife, uh, we had eight children, and my wife, um, when the kids were, were, as they were starting to get older, loved to tell the stories early when we were trying to, to uh, make it, um, that she would um, be at the cash register and get her message. She basically realized that she miscalculated and had, had put, put, take groceries out of the basket and put, put it back on the shelves. Um, and, and, and interesting enough, it goes back to one of the early comments, we, we always paid our tithing first um, before we paid any of our other bills. And, and we believe, my wife and I strongly believe that that's one of the reasons that we were able to make it and, and had much of the success that we had because the Lord blessed us. Back to, to this, one of the things early on, we didn't have a lot of money, we, we um, one of the things we would do on holidays, is, and we got the kids to agree to this, we, we said that we're gonna take part of the money that we were gonna use for gifts, and we're gonna buy someone you know, um, that we know that needs something, we're gonna buy it to them, but we're not going to tell them that it's coming from us. And we got the kids involved. We had them, you know, in the dark of night, take it up and put it on the porch, ring the bell, and run. 
One of the concepts that, that our older children today, and we've had, we have uh, four of our children in the area, five that are graduated from college, and two that are still in, in college. But one of the things they talk about is how, how fondly they remember those experiences. One of the concepts that we're trying to teach is one of the greatest joys that we can experience in life is giving something to someone that cannot do anything in return, that we know will not be able to do anything in return. So as we think about this concept of what, what do we give to members of our, our faith for their contribution, it is the blessing to get the joy of knowing that they made a difference and that they were able to help someone else as a part of this process and move the work forward. So we think that's extremely important from a belief and teaching perspective. Friends of the Word, if you let me try to ask you a question. <laughs> you run the credit union, and the business of the credit union is lending money. And you have responsibilities to the owners, public or private, of the credit union to manage their money ethically and financially properly so that it is returned. When you're doing this, does your sense of compassion or concern for the, the borrower enter into your thinking? How do you, how do you manage this? Wow, how much time do we have? Um, I, I will, thanks for asking the question. I, I would say one of the reasons I've had lots of opportunities, I've been working with credit unions for over 30 years now, probably financial services for more than 35 years, and have been recruited by a lot of banks over the years. One of the reasons that I've stayed with credit unions, even though there were stock options and other things that were available, is because our focus is on the member. It is, you know, for the bottles of credit unions are people helping people. And, and so we, we believe um, that our key focus is to think about those things. Now they're understanding we're, we're taking money from certain members and we're using that money to loan to other members and both of them are benefiting from that. So we do have to be careful that we're gonna be able to return the money back to the members that are saving it. So we have to look at that risk and we, we take, you know, those, uh, we look at those risks very seriously, but at the same time, character and, and is very important. And what you'll see is, is if you look at the empirical data over the years, um, credit unions typically um, are, are, you know, they have a much stronger history of, of helping the, those that other financial institutions won't help. But also, and here's the important thing, being repaid at a much higher rate than other financial institutions. And I believe it's because uh, we're willing to, to uh, go a little farther. We're willing to take a risk on them when other people aren't willing to take a risk. And because of that, they're very loyal and are willing to, to pay us first as a part of that process. So for, I'm very fortunate to work in an in, in, in an industry where that, that is absolutely a key focus. And that's not true for necessarily all credit unions, but it's certainly true for the one that I, that I work with. Okay, I think it's question time. As he's descending, can I talk about the concept of micro, uh, um, micro to communities where there could be a certain amount of money is given to a group and then they decide together because they know each other and they know that their grandchildren are going to live in the same village. So this community decision of how to loan money to somebody else and at what rate and, and those get extremely high returns as well. Questions? Isn't this your quiet group? Can't leave until you ask a question. No, I give okay.
Do you understand the question? Do you repeat the question for us? Uh, this church up here sends the food down to people down off the hill rather than having the Navy come up the hill to get it. What do you think of that? If, if that is the reason, and I mean, they could have other reasons too. I don't know that uh, jumping to conclusions is always uh, uh, a precarious way to do something. Well, for, for, I mean, without knowing anything at all, what I, I would always assume the best of uh, the people managing the situation, say, perhaps, by bringing it closer to where people are, because I'm assuming up the hill is not where they live. Right, that it's making sure that more people have access to the to the to the resources that they're providing. Did I misunderstand you? No, I agree. But the problem is, the same thing down the quad is called in your community. It didn't happen. We can't have a whole new problem. And now we're dealing with us to have a whole new problem because of the fact that the wrong man is up one day or two. And then there's no additional help done. Yeah, uh, yeah. I have another personal story. Um, Renner and I live on a double lot in San Pedro. And I just flew over it this weekend, and I realized it's the green spot, <laughs> literally, for miles and miles and miles, because there's so many trees. But there's a pall over our house in that a new owner bought it four years ago, um, saying he's going to build, uh, tear it down, our little house, and build um, apartments, probably uh, 15 apartments. So we're, we're addressing the issue of homelessness creating homes, but Rainer and I are going to be homeless, and so are all the animals and birds and butterflies that live there now. So nimbyism, you know, it's, it's, it's great to move into a neighborhood and then create nimbyism, but we're also grateful in so many ways that nimbyism didn't hit before we came. Um, so, how do we address community issues, not just neighborhood issues? How do we address the whole problem of poverty um, in, a, in a wider way, not just, you know, um, as protecting my resources? It, it's a, you know, it's, um, it's not easy um, always being fair. But uh, I think fairness uh, should be a, a communal, a national, an international, a universal goal. Fairness is a moving target, also. I think one of the things I've tried to bring out tonight is that there's a lot of gray in the ethical questions that we ask about helping people who are more needy than we are. And the important thing is to do what you can. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all for coming. We will see you next fall. It's very dear to my mind.